Hello, everyone. Chip Paul for Chip Talks Podcast here today to talk to you guys about gut health and about gut motility and about how all that works with your endocannabinoid system, which is pretty cool stuff. So the first question that, that we've got to ask is, you know, if we think about ourselves as a machine, as kind of a, you know, a logical construct, a, a thing that we have to, you know, provide inputs for and, and has outputs, if we sort of depersonalize ourselves and really begin to think of ourselves in terms of how we work, of, of how things, you know, come into our bodies, and how we break those things down and then how we use those things and if we're sufficient in what we need or not. So we don't really do that right now. We don't do a good job of that. You know, you look at things like the USDA's food pyramid, you know, is an attempt to do that. So what, what should we eat and, and how much things should we eat? But that's obviously not accurate. Hopefully all you guys out there know that that USDA food pyramid is not accurate. So if you look at how your body works, and, and we're going to get to the gut brain axis and digestive and all this, but I need to lay the groundwork a little bit to you guys so that you understand kind of the perspective here and why all this is so important, because it's very important. So how does your body, well, first of all, what should we eat? You know, that's always the big question right off. And that's, you know, you can find so much chaos and confusion around that subject, which is interesting because it's really pretty simple. If you look at how your body works and how your body really wants to deal with things, you have a, something called a pancreas, right? And a pancreas is responsible for giving you the enzymes that you need to digest whatever you eat. So like if you just ate a bunch of sugar, a bunch of, let's say, fruit and, and vegetables, it, you're just going to you literally have diarrhea and just poop that right out if there were no enzymes. On the other hand, if you ate a bunch of fat, like a bunch of meat or saturated fat or avocado, um, that's just going to plug you right up. You'll never get that through your system unless you have the right enzymes to digest that. And in kind of a mid-range thing, proteins. So, so proteins are just strings of amino acids. And your body really doesn't want that string of amino acids. What it wants is each individual little amino acid. And it wants to build its own strings of amino acids on its own. But it wants to do that with individual amino acids. So you have another thing that comes from your pancreas that helps you break down protein into individual amino acids. So you really have three enzymes that operate inside of you. One deals with, let's say, sugars, carbohydrates, fruits. One deals with fats and one deals with proteins. So that's kind of what we should be eating, or at least that's what your body thinks you should be eating. That's what your body is designed to digest. So anything more than that is going to be, let's say, unknown or additional work to your body, or your body's just going to view it as poison and you're going to poop it out. So that's what we're sort of dealing with. Now, it, when you eat certain things, like if I'm on mainly a carbohydrate diet, then I'm not going to have, let's say, the same bile acid composition and won't release the same bile acids as somebody who is on more of a, a fat diet, a, a meat diet or a, a plant-based, you know, more high fat diet. So why is that? Well, again, it's it's a diff completely different digestive exercise. So your body has to understand that as soon as you eat something, your body has to understand, whoop, did I just eat a fat? Did I eat protein or did I eat a carbohydrate? Because I've got to prep the pancreas. I've got to begin to release the right enzymes to be able to deal with whatever that person just put in their mouth. And it turns out we have organoleptic, uh, we have sensors in our tongue that will sense the type of things that we're eating. And, and this is new in science that they've just figured out, hey, we got this fat sensor. That's pretty important. And so we now have a sixth sensor. So we've all sort of been taught about, you know, bittersweet and all, you know, all those guys, right? Unami and, you know, all those different flavor, basically sensors that we have. Well, now they've figured out that we have a sixth one and it is a fat sensor. Again, what happens is as soon as we begin to eat fat, then we need to know that because we're going to have to digest that fat. We don't want it to plug us up. We don't want to never get rid of it. We want to use it, everything good in it. So you have to send a message 
message to our pancreas to say, crank up them fat, you know, break down enzymes because we've got some fat coming. Um, similarly, as we eat fat, fat is what produces endocannabinoids. So no boys and girls, endocannabinoids do not come from cannabis. They don't. Cannabis can supplement into your endocannabinoid system, just like turmeric can you know, supplement into a bunch of different systems in your body. So cannabis is a nice supplement, but it's not how you naturally feed your endocannabinoid system. You naturally feed your endocannabinoid system with dietary fats. It's not real sexy, but it's true. So again, as you as a vehicle have to understand the types of dietary fats that you're ingesting, you have to be able to in build endocannabinoids from those and you have to be able to use those. So again, your body is going to set a completely different tone and state if it's just if you're just ingesting carbohydrates or ingesting proteins or ingesting fats. If you're ingesting all three, like what most of us do now, so in most meals, we are eating some carbohydrate, we're eating some fat, and we're eating some protein. So we need all three of those enzymes, and, and most of us do that now. But let's say you just isolated yourself to one thing. So if you're just eating fat, again, you need the fat breakdown enzymes, but those fats that you eat are going to become, or a certain part of those fats that you eat, are going to become signaling molecules inside of you. So they're going to become endocannabinoids. And again, that's going to that feedback, that feedback of how many endocannabinoids are being built happens between our jejunum, really our small intestine, our vagal afferent nerve, and our hypothalamus hippocampus so that we know how much control we've got. If you're not eating enough omega-3 fatty acids, let's just say, again, that's super important for your body to know because you don't have a way to deflame or you don't have, let's say, the normal natural ways to deflame. So your body's got to make that up. So how does it know that right off? The structures that I'm talking about, literally from the receptors in your tongue, which communicate to your, to your hypothalamus hippocampus, through what, from your vagal afferent nerve communicates to your pancreas to tell you what types of enzymes to release. As those fats come in, you're building endocannabinoids from those fats, and you're also building all these chemical mediators from those fats. If I have saturated fat, I'm going to build a certain set of chemical mediators that are useful. Anandamide, my main endocannabinoid, so the endocannabinoid that THC mimics and supplements so anandamide is my main guy he's built from saturated fat now i have nine different endocannabinoids that i build from let's say omega-3 fat all of these are really important in how i understand let's say my calorie intake my nutrient intake how i run my brain how i manage my uh, tissue formation my cellular wall formation so all of those come from omega-3 fatty acids, and a lot of anti-inflammatories come from omega-3 fatty acids. So my body has to know if I'm eating omega-3s, because if I'm not, well, you know, I've got to offset that. And what happens is that gets offset by our microbiome. So our microbiome is allowed to build certain anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acids because we're not getting them in our diet, okay? So this feedback system, super duper important and super duper important in how to set a tone and state for your body. If your body is under, let's say, a carbohydrate setting, um, then you will be way less efficient. You will be quicker, but you'll be way less efficient than you would be under a, let's say, more fat based setting. Why? Well, carbohydrates will really translate to sugar inside of your body. And so that's real, real quick energy. So if you need to do something really, really fast, quick twitch, quick twitch muscle actions, um, you know, growing cells happens very, very fast. Cancer uses that. That's one of the things that hijacks is these quick mechanisms inside of us. But sugars are quick, but they're not efficient. So it's, it's kind of like we're fast, but we're in low gear. So we can, you know, tow a lot of stuff, but we're in low gear. When we ingest fats, Again, fats are extremely high energy. So fats are 30 to 50 times more energetic than sugars. 
our body does something called beta oxidize, which is a more complicated, but way more robust way to produce energy when we're burning fats versus sugars. Um, so again, this is everything and how your body understands kind of what we're taking in, how you, you know, we program, the best way to say this is we program our body by our food. What does that programming look like? Well, it looks like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And depending on how much of each of those things, and then some subcategories in those things, we set a tone for our body. Now, if I'm wanting to help you, if I'm really wanting to understand how you work, and I'm really wanting to help you, I need to understand that this is going on. And I need to, let's say, even target feed you with certain things so that I can get in the middle of those downstream processes and help your body repair itself. And this is the way that we're going to be doing drug development in the future. So I might give you a certain fat profile to eat before 30 minutes before I give you a supplement. That's how important this is, because I may want to set a tone in your body. I may want to set an action in your body. I may want to program your body in a certain way so that it's way more open to a supplement and so that that supplement is way more effective. Now, we don't even begin to do this now. Um, even I'll, I'll give you an example of this, and this is just sort of a general products, natural product, not going at any pharma company in this example, so whew, don't have to worry about anything, but let's go at something common, right? So melatonin. So we've all, you know, kind of know, and you know, urban legend, or we just kind of know it somehow that, that melatonin will help you sleep, okay? Well, it will help you do that, but it does a lot of other things. It's really an important signaling molecule in your body. But it turns out that let's say you wanted to use it for sleep and don't do this. There's better ways to do for sleep. It's just a good example because everybody understands it. But let's say you wanted to use melatonin for your sleep. OK, and um, just on a whim, you decide to take melatonin at noon. So you take melatonin at noon, fully expecting it's going to make you tired. I want to take an afternoon nap. I'm going to take my melatonin at noon. No, it won't do anything to you. Why? Because it's not time yet. You don't have receptors expressed to receive that melatonin. Without receptors expressed, it's just a circulating thing in your bloodstream that you'll pee or poop out. Um, with acceptors expressed, melatonin is going to dock and things are going to happen. So you don't really express your melatonin receptors till the evening, till you know after 6 p.m. So melatonin really won't have an effect on you until after 6 p.m. Now it does signal around some other things and it doesn't just affect the melatonin receptor and it, yes it will affect those other things even at noon but as far as sleep and all that it's it's you, you got to have the receptor expressed so that he can dock with it so that he can do all his downstream transcriptional activities and help you go to sleep right so melatonin is a good example of something that is we have to understand its actions and understand what's going on. And if we do, then we can blow with the wind. So I can give it to you at six o'clock. Your body's ready to receive it. It's going to make you sleepy. Blowing with the wind. I give it to you at noon. Nothing's going to happen. Fighting with the wind. So same thing happens to you as we eat. We're programming ourselves. We're setting a tone. And in fact, this is so fine and delicate that the ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids will set a tone in you that is just night and day different, okay? So, so if I feed you, let's say, one omega-3 fatty acid to one omega-6 fatty acid, so if I give you a one-to-one, -one, you're going to be really healthy. It's going to be really hard to get you sick. Um, you're going to have a really robust immune system. You're going to be well-balanced in all of your systems. Uh, you're not going to be real disbalanced. You're going to be kind of running as you were intended to run. If I begin to alter that ratio, if I begin to feed you one omega-3 to four omega-6s, now we get a little wonky. We're still good, but we get a little wonky. If I change that ratio to one omega-3 to 10 omega-6s, now things begin to get dysregulated. Now you have a more inflammatory tone in your immune system you're way more sensitive to anything that's going to inflame you. And in fact, the things that inflame you are going to make you sick because you can't mediate that inflammation. You can inflame, but you can't really deflame. Um, and you're going to be chronically inflamed. If I make that one to 20, omega-3 to omega-6, wow, 
boy, I just put you in a horrible health situation. I've done one of the worst things that I can possibly do to you. I have I've created the opportunity for you to be chronically inflamed almost all the time. You're going to always be sick. You're not going to have a robust immune system. You're going to be real subjected to pathogens. Um, you're going to suffer from autoimmune diseases. You're not going to be able to close your junctions and your you know blood vessels and your endothelial la layers. Um, you're just going to be one sick puppy. And guess what? That's right where we're at. You're going to be obese. So you're going to absolutely not be able to control your weight. And that is right where we're at, boys and girls. In fact, we are 1 to 20 or over in our omega-3 to omega-6 consumption. So we are literally programming ourselves to set a very, very sick, very diseased profile. And all it takes is changing the fat profiles that we eat. Because it's very well demonstrated in literature that one-to-one -one creates a robust organism. The lady that did that underlying research, I'll give her cred because I like her. She's a friend. So her name is Dr. Artemis Simopoulos. And she did all the underlying omega-3, omega-6 research back in the, I guess, late 80s, 90s. Um, she was sidelined, really. Uh, she was certainly an NIH researcher. You know, lots of cred, lots of pub has published a lot of papers and really is the preeminent expert on the Mediterranean diet and on omega-3 and omega-6 ratios and all this. Now, she didn't understand the why yet. She didn't understand that these create endocannabinoids and that all this really kind of goes back to the endocannabinoid system that's in the background and kind of the why of all this happens. Um, in conversations with her, I was able to discuss that with her and um, hopefully enlighten her a little bit about that, which was fun. She certainly enlightened me a lot about omega-3 and omega-6 balance. But it's the most important, you know, most important health tip I could ever give you, intermittent fast. Second most important health tip I could ever give you, balance your omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Because you set a tone in your body if they're balanced where your body is helping you. It's helping you fight disease. It's helping you if you have cancer. You know, it's helping the chemo work better. It's helping, you know, pharmaceuticals work better. It's helping supplements work better. So we want to understand our bodies well enough to be able to set this state by our diet and by our eating behavior where it's a known state, where we know that this is going to be a healthy state for this individual by their eating behavior and by their eating contents that we know this is stable. It's healthy. It's robust. It's a robust immune system. We don't have that right now. We're, we're unstable. In fact, you know, if you eat, uh, you know, if you just eat normally, it, you're in a very disease uh, promoting, unstable situation. So what we're trying to do is educate you guys about how we get the stability, how we get the stability. So intermittent fasting is a way to begin to get the stability making sure that you're getting enough omega-3 fatty acids. It, really, this just goes back to that ratio. So eventually, I'm going to be talking to you about ratio. But right now, you eat plenty of omega-6 fatty acids. Not a problem. If you eat corn, you eat plenty of omega-6s. What I need to do is get you to eat more omega-3 so that we can begin to offset that you know, dichotomy right now. Because with just the amount of omega-6s, we, we're setting this diseased, inflammatory, cancer, autoimmune, you know, promoting situation that we shouldn't be in. So bottom line here, hopefully you guys got this out of this uh, little podcast is that, you know, you have a lot of control over your situation and over your body, over how you work. And that control is issued by what you put in your mouth and by how, how frequently you put things in your mouth. So as we begin to understand this, and again, I'm working hard to teach you guys this, but as we begin to understand this, we can begin to take back control of our health. We can begin to take back control of these states that we put ourselves in. Anyway, hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed this chip talk. So we'll be talking a lot more about this. We talk about this in almost every chip talks, this, you know, sort of our relationship with food and, and all that. But this is a little bit more detail on the mechanisms, your tasting mechanisms, your gut and pancreas mechanisms, and kind of how you program yourself around food. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll see you next time for another exciting episode of Chip Talks. See you guys. Bye.